Hi, my name is David, and I try to play guitar. I'm not very good, as you can tell. One day, I saw a video of blues great Joe Bonamassa getting very technical about his guitar amplifiers. For guitar player, that guy really knows his stuff about amps. He inspired me to learn more. But to really understand guitar amps, you need to take them apart and put them back together. I watched hundreds of videos. I read all kinds of books. From Craigslist and eBay, I bought a used soldering iron, some old voltmeters, an ancient oscilloscope, and other test gear. Eventually, I built an entire electronics lab. Now, I guess I'm sort of an amp mechanic. I fix other electronics too, and this, well, this is my journey. I figured I'd share so others can learn too. I hope you like it, and just as a disclaimer, be sure to consult an expert before working with electricity. Hi everybody, Dave the Amp Mechanic coming to you from my amp lab in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, if you've been following my videos, you know that I talk a lot about this Crate Vintage Club 30 that's on the bench behind me. It's sitting in my custom-made cradle. I want to do another video about that cradle because they're very helpful if you are doing the sort of work that I'm doing on vintage tube amplifiers and radios. Now, this amp is not exactly a vintage amplifier. It's from the early 90s, so it's a mixture of solid-state technology and tube technology. Uh, not the best amplifier to start on, but it is the amplifier I started on because when I first broke into the business, and it's not really a business, it's a hobby, I don't charge money for, for doing any of this work, uh, my luthier, the guy who fixes my guitars, his name is Al, he said, here, take this, it doesn't work at all, I can't get any sound out of it. And he handed me the chassis to this vintage uh, Club 30 amp uh, from Crate. So. Uh, I took it home, and I was like, great, I've got a, my first amp, my first job to work on, and I'm going to really learn a lot working with this amplifier. And I did learn a lot, but I made a ton of rookie mistakes. And I filmed like dozens of hours of video thinking that I would post a big, long video on how I fix this amplifier up to YouTube so people could learn from it. But all those hours of video, it's just too much. So I'm condensing it into a much shorter video that catches you up on some of the mistakes I made, what I learned, uh, what was wrong with the amplifier, because I eventually figured it out, and uh, where we are right now and the few last steps I have to go before I deliver it back to Al, my luthier. So uh, when I first got the amplifier and he handed it to me, uh, I looked right into the chassis and one of the first things I noticed was a bunch of uh, capacitors that looked a little bit like this, and I don't know if you can really see it that well, I'll hold it up here and hopefully the camera will autofocus on it. But if you look closely, you can see that uh, the uh, capacitor is domed and uh, on the top. Now these capacitors are really supposed to be flat. And when I looked at that, I said, well, aha, I know exactly what's wrong with this amp. It's got a bunch of blown electrolytic capacitors. So I'll just take them out and put new ones in and we'll be off to the races. This amp will start working right away. Well. Guess what? Wasn't the case. And that was my first real big rookie mistake was just assuming that the capacitors were bad, pulling them out and uh, replacing them because once I did that, uh, the amp still didn't work. And then I thought, well, maybe I should test those capacitors to see if they're bad. And it turned out that all of them were pretty good except for one. And so that was probably good news in that at least there was a capacitor that was a problem. Now, when I first got started, I didn't have any gear to test the capacitors with to see if they worked or not, especially while they were still in circuit. Since then, I've acquired uh, a variety of test uh, diagnostic gear in order to test capacitors both in and out of circuit. And so I would advise you before you go removing uh, any capacitors from anything, uh, you give them a test, unless they're the really, really old waxy kind that, uh, are you, that you find in many old uh, amplifiers and uh, radios that just need to go anyway. So uh, one of the reasons I thought they were bad was because they had this dome on the top. Uh, and as it turns out, they should be flat, but it's really just a cover. In reality, that uh, cover comes off and you can see the actual uh, flat top that you normally see, the shiny silver top on a, on a capacitor, and they were all flat. But like I said, one of them turned out to be bad, and it was one of the key capacitors in the circuit, so it could have easily been one of the culprits in preventing any sound from getting uh, out to the speaker. 
So um, I did what a lot of amp techs do. I shotgunned the, uh, the big electrolytic capacitors. I took all these big ones out and replaced them. And uh, the amp still didn't work. So what did I do next? Well, uh, then uh, I took a look at the tubes, right? And uh, I started messing around with the tubes. I happen to have a tube tester here and I took all of the uh, output tubes, the EL84s, this is one of them, and I uh, stuck them on the tube tester and I discovered that one of them had a short. Well, uh, why didn't I do that in the first place? I don't know, I even had the tube tester here, but uh, I just, it just didn't occur to me uh, to try that first, being the rookie that I was. So with one tube having a short in it, that is also a problem. Uh, especially an output tube. So uh, I, uh, uh, I went back to the owner of the amp, Al, and I said, Al, we, uh, we're going to need some new tubes. Now I could either buy uh, one EL84 or I could buy a matched set. Now this particular amplifier has four output tubes. And uh, I said I recommended buying a matched set of five at bare minimum. That way, if one of the tubes goes bad, you still have another tube that matches the remaining three. Um, might be a good idea to buy match sets of six, seven, or eight tubes. That way, you always know that if a tube goes bad, uh, you can replace it with one that matches uh, the rest of the tubes that are still working in the amplifier. So just a little tip there. But anyway, this is the one that was bad. I stuck a little yellow sticker on it. It says short. Uh, the, my tube tester um, showed that it was shorting out. And uh, so I still didn't have a working amplifier. So what else could go wrong? You know, I didn't know. And, and one of the big mistakes I made in trying to repair this amp is I never stopped to look closely at the schematic for the amplifier first. And this is one particular schematic that you have to study super closely because it's got all sorts of hints and clues as to what you should do in order to make sure the amplifier is in working order. Now, what were the mistakes I made? Well, uh, had I looked at the uh, schematic in the first place, I would have learned uh, a lot more about the amp itself. In other words, how it's all wired up, what each of the capacitors do, like what part of the circuit they're in. But I've also, I would have also learned uh, um, a little bit about what uh, voltages I should be observing at all the different uh, test points throughout the circuit. This schematic is actually an excellent, excellent schematic. It has over 20 test points, each of which will uh, reveal a certain AC voltage and maybe even a DC voltage. Uh, not just those, but also it shows the um, the the oscilloscope, what, the sort of curve you should observe on your oscilloscope, uh, the waveform that is. So uh, the schematic is actually very instructional in terms of uh, exactly what it takes to have the amplifier in uh, working condition. So I studied the amplifier schematic even more and one of the things I discovered is it tells you, uh, for example, uh, how to set all the knobs, um, the volume knobs, the treble, the bass, the mid-range, um, the reverb knobs, uh, the dirty channel, the clean channel. It tells you how to set all those knobs for when you're doing tests. It also tells you uh, what sort of uh, resistance is expected on the uh, reverb circuit, which is very important because if you are going to be looking at this table of test points and all of the expected voltages and the waveforms, then you know that you have to set up your test bench according to the way they set theirs up at their uh, manufacturing facility, um, or you're not going to get the same readings or anything even close to that. Uh, one of the things I discovered when I uh, started working on the amp was that I didn't have the impedance that was necessary on the reverb circuit at all. Uh, the schematic, of course, was saying that I needed to have 150 ohms of resistance there. And since all I had was the chassis uh, and the wires that connected the reverb tank were just hanging off the back of the chassis, didn't, uh, didn't really help me at all in terms of uh, giving me the sort of uh, uh, you know, observations that I was supposed to be seeing at the, all of the different test points. So I went back to Al and I said, Al, I need your reverb tank. In fact, why don't you just give me the whole cabinet? So he gave me the cabinet. Uh, I 
removed the reverb tank uh, and discovered that it was a replacement reverb tank and actually uh, not exactly the right reverb tank. It didn't, uh, the, the replacement that he had used was uh, different in terms of its specification from the one that was originally in the amplifier. Uh, it didn't provide 150 ohms of resistance, it provided 600 ohms of resistance. So that also is going to be problematic because I couldn't use the reverb tank uh, as uh, a means of providing the necessary resistance in the circuit for doing all of my tests. So that's when I got out my resistance box and I basically said, all right, I'll use my uh, resistor substitution box from Sencore to sit in place of the reverb tank. Uh, now, here again, another rookie thing. Uh, one of the um, uh, personal things that I wanted to get into when it came to setting up this lab is I wanted to use a lot of uh, vintage equipment, vintage gear, vintage oscilloscopes, signal generators, things of that nature, the old Heath kit capacitor testers and resistance substitution boxes. And one of the problems is once you start acquiring all that stuff, and I've acquired quite a bit of it, you can see some of it above me here, uh, the, um, uh, it, all of it needs some form of rejuvenation. So uh, none of it is actually working according to spec and trying to use that gear which hasn't been rejuvenated yet in order to do your diagnostics can be a little tricky. So for example, my Sencore substitution, uh, resistor substitution box uh, doesn't uh, res provide the resistance that it says it's going to provide when you turn the knob on it. For example, if you put it at 100, it provides 108 ohms of resistance. You put it at 150, it provides 157 ohms of resistance. So that makes it a little bit tricky, uh, but it's passable. Um, but also a reminder of what it takes to really get your lab up and running and in tip-top shape. You want all of your gear to be as uh, well calibrated as uh, it possibly can. So after replacing the tubes and after replacing the capacitors, as I said I did, uh, I still wasn't getting the amp to function properly. And so what was the problem? Uh, still couldn't get any sound out of it. And I studied the, the uh, schematic some more, and I noticed that the, there's a header uh, where the uh, power connections are coming out of the uh, power transformer, um, have to connect, uh, and the connections to the header are different depending on whether the amplifier is going to be running off of a standard North American circuit at 120 volts, or a, uh, a European circuit at, uh, at 240 volts. And guess what? Well, the, um, the connector that goes on that header was actually connected to the uh, 240 volt uh, connector. I would not have noticed that had I not looked at the schematic. So again, another reminder, you know, get the schematic and study the schematic very closely and then study the circuit of your amplifier to see if it all matches up. Uh, where the schematic tells you that a certain resistor should have 220 kilo ohms of resistance or whatever it may be, check those things. Check it all out. You know, you're going to find some stuff that's wrong just by studying the schematic and then doing some tests or even just looking at the circuit because the, uh, where that wire was connected to the header, uh, it was just connected to the wrong one. So I got, I got those three things corrected, right? I, I, I had one bad capacitor, I had a bad uh, uh, tube, um, EL84, I had uh, a, um, a connector that was uh, connecting to the wrong part of the header, thinking that we were hooking up to a 240 volt circuit in Europe. I remedied those three problems and wow, I mean this amp started screaming. I mean. It was loud. It was uh, working nearly perfectly. Uh, the only thing that's left right now is we're getting a little bit of static. Uh, it's almost like pot static. You know, the uh, if you're moving the uh, the pots around, you hear this <laughs> sound uh, in the background, and I pretty much know what that's going to be. So uh, the next steps I'm going to take here, I'm going to clean the pots out uh, with you know some uh, pot cleaner. Uh, I'm also going to clean out all the tube sockets because that can awful, uh, also be a source of that kind of problem. I'll uh, put all the new tubes in, so um, whereas I just used one of the five brand new tubes 
and I put it in with the other three that it was not really matched with just so if I can get the amp working. Um, the, uh, now I'll put all the matching tubes in and uh, once I get it all cleaned up, I'm, I'm pretty confident it's going to work. So I'll show you these last remaining steps. Now, one last thing I want to talk about is a little bit of uh, learnings in the area of amplifier design. So when I first started putting my digital multimeter and my oscilloscope on this amp, I was uh, observing some voltages which were pretty high and I thought, well, um, is this a problem? Is there something going on here? And uh, I thought maybe I have to re-bias this amplifier, uh, particularly the output tubes. Now, as I said before, there's four EL84 output tubes. They all share one single uh, bias resistor uh, on, on the cathode. Uh, so, you know, their cathodes all connect to one resistor or one resistor and capacitor that are in parallel to each other. And the, the, the resistor is a 60 ohm resistor. It's not a very big resistor at all. And uh, I started checking it out and I realized that in the end, um, just like a lot of amplifier designers, uh, these, these, uh, this amplifier runs very hot. Uh, the, the, the output tubes are all very hot to the touch. In fact, you can't hang on to them for very long. And if you study the, uh, the specifications on the EL84, you'll see that the amplifier designers are just pushing the very limits, and that's not uncommon. So, for example, if uh, they say that the, uh, the most output wattage you should have per tube is 12 watts, they'll push it to 12.5 or 12.7, as, as, as long as it's within about 10% of its range. And, and that, I've learned over the last year from watching a lot of videos and doing a lot of reading, is very commonplace for lots of amplifier manufacturers. You just push their amplifiers uh, and the tubes that they put in them a little beyond what the specifications say to get the most out of them. Uh, the downside of that, and there is a downside, and maybe I'll come back and change that resistor out at some point. Uh, it will depend on what Al wants. Um, the downside of that is that wears the heck out of your tubes. So, you know, if I, uh, I may not get the kind of sound that I want out of this amplifier, I've decided to put a bigger resistor in there to uh, pull down the, um, the plate dissipation on those output tubes, but at the same time, uh, the tubes will last a lot longer. And knowing Al, he doesn't need the crazy, crunchy um, sound at full volume uh, that somebody might want on stage, right? And so that's, that's where you have to make some of these decisions as you're working on these amplifiers, is like, what is it the owner really wants? And, and how is he going to, or she, uh, going to enjoy or get the most enjoyment out of the amplifier? Uh, replacing tubes, especially uh, EL84 output tubes, is, is not a lot of fun. It could get, a lot of, could get pretty expensive. So um, I'll touch base with Al and see if he wants me to put another resistor in there to kind of um, bias the, the, the tubes uh, in a way that they're not um, so hot, uh, but for the time being, I've got the amplifier working, uh, and I'm going to do a few last-minute things here to it, and put it back together so I can deliver it back to him and let him mess around with it for a while, and then he can decide what he wants to do. So let's get to those final steps. Okay, so as the uh, final uh, mode or phase of the uh, getting this amp back to my uh, customer, my luthier. What I'm going to do is um, check some resistances uh, around the circuit board here. Just double check to make sure some of these resistors are doing what they should be doing. And I'm also going to double check the plate dissipation on the output tubes. These are the four output tube sockets, the EL84s, which by the way is the uh, little brother, if you want to call it that, to so the EL34s. Uh, and the reason we do that is we're, we're double checking the bias. So a couple things I want to point out here before we get started. One is that each of these sockets, these, the, the, these plastic sockets, uh, one of the things I like about them is that the pins are numbered. So you, while you can't 
may not be able to see it. I'll try to zoom in on this when I edit the video, but there are literally little plastic uh, numbers here. One, two, three, four. The pins are numbered on each of these. So you know which pin is what. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know which pin is going to be the plate, which pin is going to be the cathode. And the other thing that's nice about these sockets is if you look very closely, you can see these re recessed metal tabs in here. And those tabs make it pretty easy uh, to check each of the pins by, you know, just poking your, your probe in there. At the same time, the way these metal tabs are recessed in these sockets, it makes it sort of safe uh, in case of an accident. Like, it's not easy to brush your hand up against one of these metal tabs uh, and perhaps deliver uh, a lethal shock to yourself. Now, if you're following some of the uh, widely publicized best practices when it comes to amp tech safety, then uh, that really shouldn't be a problem for you. And uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, so, when you're working with an amp like this that has high voltage on the different uh, pins and, and area, various other areas of, of the, uh, the circuit board or, or just the, uh, you know, the chassis, these, these, for example, these, these capacitors, some of them hold 400 volts or more, um, you never, ever, ever want to have two hands in here when the amp is on or when the amp is off and you're not sure if the capacitors have discharged their voltage or not. At most, one hand. And as you can see, I'm using my favorite tool, uh, a very inexpensive tool. You get them for free when you order Chinese food, uh, a chopstick. And you can poke around and you can tap on things while the amp is on to see if something's loose. You're not putting your finger uh, on anything that has any high voltage. Now, if you have one hand in your pocket and you touch one of these things, um, it, the chances of getting uh, killed by that are pretty low because the problem shows up when you've got both hands in here and somehow your uh, hands complete a circuit and the current goes through one hand up your arm, through your heart, and through the other arm. It only takes a few milliamps to stop your heart. So you really be, need to be thinking about safety first whenever working on an amplifier. And just again, as a disclaimer, I'm just talking about all the dangers here and the precautions. I'm not advising you to go sticking your hands in here. Uh, please, um, you know, if you're going to be doing work on amplifiers or old radios, anything with high voltage, uh, you do that at your own risk. It's uh, very important that we state that. So um, one way... Uh, to ensure safety, of course, is when you're working with your digital multimeter, um, you take one of your probes and you clip it to something uh, so that you're only probing uh, with one other probe and a hand. You don't have to stick two hands in here, each hand on a probe, uh, kind of like this. You don't really want to be ever be doing that when the amp is on. Uh, preferably, you do that when you can clip both probes to something and then no hands are in the amplifier. Uh, you clip them on when it's off. Now, one of the downsides of that is when you're testing voltage and, uh, and uh, resistance on different parts of the uh, circuit with an eye towards biasing the amp, um, one of the challenges is you really want to do some of these tests when the amp and the tubes have warmed up and they're, and they're up and running. And so uh, constantly cycling the amp on and off, you know, um, you might not get the best possible readings. What you're trying to do is emulate the same operating conditions that, let's say, you know, a guitar player, a guitar player might be um, uh, using the amp in. You want to you want to bias for those conditions. Um, you may even want to put, you know, a signal through uh, the, the amp when you're doing this. And, uh, and that, of course, is what we will do uh, when we take some of these readings. So, uh, one other thing uh, towards that um, notion of safety is that uh, I noticed 
uh, after studying this, I see these jumpers here. The, I don't know if you can see that. I'm pretty sure you can. But these, these little metal jumpers. And if you study very closely, if you look at the, uh, you follow the path in the circuit board, you can see that, like, for example, this jumper comes off of pin three, and it goes across here, and then it goes all the way over here. And where that's going is to this resistor, right? This is the shared cathode bias resistor among these four tubes, right? So you got pin three here, and it goes to this jumper, and it goes all the way across here to, to this guy. And the same is true here. You can almost see it go, you can see it cut across here and go up here to there. Got another one over here. And uh, pin three over here uh, appears to be lacking that jumper. I don't see it anywhere. Uh, it just kind of goes up and cuts across uh, over to here. But one thing you could do, um, and by the way, again, this amp is off, and uh, it's been off for over a week, and so it's easy to do this. I've got my multimeter set to resistance, and you can test to see, well, is there continuity? When you have these jumpers, you can test to see if there's continuity. So I can just put my probe here on number three, and on that jumper, and sure enough, if you look at the, uh, the multimeter, it's very low ohms reading, 0.2 ohms, right? And the same thing can we do here. Let's try it there. Low ohms reading, right? Uh, let's try it over here. Same thing, right? So uh, why do I do that? Well, those little jumpers, unfortunately, they're not shown on the schematic. I, I wish they would show those on the schematic because then it would be obvious what jumpers are connected to what. These, these things show up all over the, the circuit board. Uh, but the reason that's so critical and helpful is because let's say you uh, want to practice the ultimate in safety. Uh, well, what you can do is you can take one of these types of probes. It's a clip-on probe. And uh, let's see if I can get it to open up there. I don't know if you can see that. The little uh, um, uh, clip-on connector coming out of the probe. But then I can just, uh, when I'm testing, if that's going to be a test point where I'm going to take a reading, I can just basically clip the probe on there to that guy like that. And I can also clip uh, my other, I can use a clip-on probe for my other probe, and I can just do it completely hands-free. Or I can, you know, have one clipped on like that, and then the other one is not clipped on, like this red one, and I can test whatever it is I want to test. So that's a big advantage of having these jumpers here. And the best thing to do to double check on the continuity from the jumper to, let's say, a pin is, again, what I just did with the multimeter. So I'm going to take this off for now. And sometimes they're a little tricky. Um, the other thing that I've been thinking about with this amp is that um, as I said earlier, uh, each of these uh, output tubes uh, is biased through a shared uh, cathode bias resistor. It's this one right here. 60 ohms, 10 watts if you look at the, uh, at the schematic. And one of the challenges is when, you're, um, when you have a shared bias resistor like that, if your tubes are, you know, uh, not exactly matched, and very often they're matched, but you know, when you buy a matched set, they're matched, but there's still some differences, and maybe there's something else in the way on the circuit that's kind of changing it a little bit. Um, uh, maybe um, the uh, screen grid is slightly different from one of these to the next. The screen grid, whenever you're biasing uh, tubes using the cathode bias method, in, of measuring things, um, you have to also take into account the uh, the amps on the screen grid. Um, you know, you can't individually bias each of these tubes. So one of the things I was thinking about, and I might even give it a try, I'm not sure, I'm just thinking about it right now, is if this is the jumper right here, right, uh, to uh, getting over here to the cathode uh, bias resistor, the shared one, I could, technically speaking, I could clip this in half, bend the leads up, and put uh, it's an individual resistor on each one of these. 
For example, I could put a, like a one ohm resistor there uh, if I wanted to, just to help me measure each tube individually. Or maybe what I do is I take out this resistor and I give each one of these guys their own. What that would mean is, is that I would have to clip the, the, the jumper, put uh, a new resistor in there, right? Um, on each one of these, uh, for each one of these guys. And then the other side uh, would go to ground, but I would also have to um, parallel in uh, a bypass capacitor uh, because if you look at the, uh, the schematic, we're talk we've got you know not only this resistor here but there's a um, bypass capacitor and I believe um, that could be the one right there so then if you're ever going to do that if you're going to switch from a shared uh, cathode bias resistor to individual ones for each tube you also have to remember that if there's a bypass capacitor there you have to add that as well so that's an option here I'm not sure if I'm going to go for it or not but uh, one thing I will do is um, think about it. Uh, the good news is, is that my, um, my luthier, who is the customer in this case, Al, he's like, yeah, you yeah, know, have fun with it. Figure things out. You know, again, I'm learning uh, as I go here. Uh, one of the things they say out there in the world is the best way to learn is to teach. That's why I do these videos. I don't make any money from them. I don't make any money by repairing these amps. I'm just having fun with it. So what are the next steps here? Next step for me is I'm going to warm this amp up. I'm going to get it up to, uh, to um, you know, its operating temperature and all that. Let it warm up for like maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, so that everything kind of stabilizes. Uh, and then we're going to take the measurements that I need to take in order to uh, buy, uh, you know, get the, find the, date, the plate dissipation on each of these tubes. And for this particular part of my tests, we're going, uh, in terms of biasing the tubes, we're going to pick the output transformer method, which means that we're going to take some measurements off the output transformer center tap, which is uh, right here, this red wire. We're also going to take um, a measurements um, across uh, the, from each of the tubes to the center tap, and uh, we're going to measure the resistance on uh, the uh, across fr from the center tap uh, across um, each side of, of the winding. Uh, so this is the center tap. Here's one side of the winding going to these two tubes. Here's another side of the winding going to these two tubes. So we'll measure that resistance. And uh, then uh, the final data we'll need in order to calculate uh, the, um, uh, the, the bias and the plate dissipation will be uh, the um, voltage drop uh, from the plate of each of these tubes to the cathode, right? And uh, we're picking this method for bias. I know there's a lot of different methods. You could actually use the uh, cathode bias resistor method of, of measuring, um, but based on everything that I've read and, and, uh, and looked at, the most accurate way uh, of determining um, the plate dissipation is to use the output transformer method. Um, there are like three methods that you can use, maybe even more to be honest. You can use the uh, cathode transistor method, as I mean the cathode uh, resistor method as I've just mentioned. There's also uh, a way of doing it with an oscilloscope when you have a push-pull configuration like this going on either side of the center tap of, uh, of the uh, amp. This is what they call a class AB amp. Um, you could also uh, look to try to measure the current on each of these tubes directly using what's called a shunt method. Uh, and, and that's essentially where uh, you put your digital multimeter in the path of the amperage um, that's going to each tube and you measure the amps directly. Uh, the problem is, is that's super dangerous because it's really easy to make a mistake and give yourself the jolt of your life. Most people don't like to do that and, uh, and it's been shown that uh, the output transformer method of getting to the amps uh, for, uh, that's going through each of the tubes, um, you know, the amperage that's on your plate, is actually uh, only like at most one amp off 
uh, so why, I'm sorry, one milliamp off. So why bother uh, taking the risk when um, at most you're going to be off by a milliamp and take in terms of taking your measurements, which uh, that one milliamp is, is pretty much inconsequential to, to the final biasing of the tubes. So uh, that's it. I'm going to use the output transformer method. Uh, uh, look for um, some other videos on my channel. They won't be up by the time I put, publish this one that cover um, all of those different other methods because I'm, I'm going to show you how I do them uh, using those methods uh, and you can compare because uh, we'll use this amp as well to do those other methods. We can compare each of them to see uh, which one delivers um, the most accurate numbers, where the numbers differ, uh, etc. Okay, so the next step for me uh, is to warm this amp up and then we'll take some, uh, some measurements uh, on the uh, output transformer and on each of the tubes. Alrighty, our amp is all warmed up and ready to go. We've uh, been warming it up for about an hour. So uh, the tubes are all warmed up. The output transformer is uh, basically operating at some condition that it would operate at if you had this uh, amp um, working on a stage or something like that. So let's go over what we're going to do here. Remember that we're going to use the output transformer method for determining the plate dissipation on each of the output tubes and, uh, and then ultimately kind of deciding where we are in terms of uh, biasing those tubes. Now, just to review really quickly here, these are our output tube sockets here. I'm using a chopstick whenever I poke around in a circuit on an amplifier that is up and running. Going to be very careful. And uh, the, this is the center uh, cathode resistor that um, is used to bias all of the tubes. In other words, they're all uh, connected to this bias. Their cathodes of each of these tubes is connected to this bias, uh, bias, uh, cathode bias resistor. And so uh, theoretically speaking, anything that you might do uh, to this amp to adjust its bias would involve changing this resistor. This is a uh, 60 ohm, 10 watt resistor. Uh, so when we do the uh, output transformer style of determining plate dissipation, um, there are uh, a handful of measurements we need to take, and I want to review them with you. Uh, one of them is the raw plate voltage of each tube. Now, uh, on the EL84, pin number 7 is the plate. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure with uh, our uh, common probe from our voltmeter, from our digital multimeter uh, on chassis ground and the other probe probing the recessed tabs in inside each of these where it says number seven, we will measure the uh, plate voltage, the raw plate voltage. Then we'll do the exact same thing for the raw cathode voltage, which is pin number three. Same setup. Right now, what will we do with that? What we're trying to get at is the actual uh, sort of adjusted plate voltage for the tube when we and we'll use that to help calculate our plate dissipation. There is actually another way to arrive at that same number, the adjusted plate voltage. You can just uh, measure across the plate and the cathode. So you can put your uh, common uh, probe from the digital multimeter on uh, number number three and your uh, other probe on number seven and look at the uh, voltage that way. We're going to do both just so you can see whether they're, the, whether they're close or not. All right. Then uh, you need the voltage drop from the plate of the uh, of each tube to the center tap of the output transformer. This red wire here is the center tap of the output transformer. These are the two other sides. And so we'll measure from here to uh, where this terminal is for the, um, uh, the, the slow blow fuse. Uh, this red wire here is connected to a tab, and, it, and the next stop in the circuit is right here. So we can use that and just kind of stick the probe on that. This will involve changing 
our um, the probe that we use for the common side of the digital multimeter because uh, we want to clip to these jumpers here, which are also connected to the plate, one probe and only be probing in the circuit with one hand. This is very important. You got to keep one hand behind your back or in your pocket at all times when working with a live amplifier. There's, there's just no way around that. You've got to do that. Um, it, too many mistakes are easy to make uh, when you've got two hands in the amp. Okay, once we have all those calculations, the last thing we need, and we'll turn the amp off for this one, is the resistance from each plate to the center tap. And then we'll have everything we need to plug into a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet that I will share with you um, so that you can uh, plug your own stuff in uh, and, and do the calculations to get to uh, our plate dissipation for each one of these tubes. So let's get started here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to measure uh, the, um, vo the raw plate voltage on each one of these tubes. I'm going to turn my digital multimeter to DC that's the one with the uh, straight lines here. And uh, this one is AC with a curvy line, right? Alternating current. All right. And uh, now we're just going to measure and write down uh, the, uh, the raw voltage on the plate of each one of the EL84 output tubes. So let's go ahead and check um, the first tube. Pin 7 on the first tube is showing us 294 point... Well, 294 point... 295. Let's try one more time. 295. 295.5. All right, so write that down. Okay. 295.5. All right, next up, we're going to try the same measurement on the plate of this one, tube, on, on uh, tube number two. 295.5. Five. Okay. Two ninety five five. Same thing. Let's go to number three. Number three is two ninety seven. Two ninety. Let's call it two ninety seven point one. Seven point one, and lastly, let's go ahead and uh, go to tube number four. Two ninety. So we're moving around there. Two ninety seven point. Oh, it's going up. Two ninety seven point three or four. Two ninety seven point four. Let's call it. Two ninety seven point four. All right, next we're going to do uh, the cathode voltage, same setup. So we're not changing anything, right, and only using one hand. So we're on tube number uh, one, looking at pin number three, and that's 9.4, 9.4. Okay, we'll write that down, 9.4. Okay, then we'll go do the same measurement on this guy, 9.42, we'll call it 9.42. All right, now let's try tube number three, 9.45. 0.45, and let's go to pin number three on the fourth tube, 9.46, 9.46, all right, now we want to get the uh, uh, plate uh, to cathode voltage, I was telling you about that a little bit earlier. And so uh, this is, we just took the measurements we really need for that because we just subtract the cathode voltage 
from the plate voltage to get the tubes um, adjusted plate voltage. But uh, since we're here, I'm going to show you the other way of doing that. So first thing I'll do is I'll disconnect the uh, common probe from the digital multimeter. Uh, and I'm going to uh, put our other probe on as soon as I can find it. Here we go. This is our clip-on probe. Remember I mentioned earlier that the plate um, for each of these tubes, pin 7, is connected directly to this jumper that's right next to it on each one of these guys. So, what I do now is I'm going to clip the common probe, one hand behind my back, to that guy right there. So now he's on number 7. And then I can take my other probe and I can put it on uh, pin 3. And you'll see that here is 285, 285.3. 285.3. So write that down. 285.3. Let's go ahead and move this guy over to the next one. Try this one here, 284.283, let's call it 284. All right, one hand behind the back. Let's go ahead and move this guy down the line here. There we go. And let's poke on Pin three again, 287.4, 287.4, and last but not least, fix this, got one hand solidly behind my back, all right, we're going to poke on number three here. 287.8, 287.8. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we want to get the voltage drop from the plate uh, to the center tap. And we're going to go through that. Same setup here. We've got one of our probes clipped on to the plate. And now we're just going to look at the center tap. So let's look see what the voltage drop is. We're on tube number four, it's 5.39. So we'll put down 5.39. Tube number four. Move my mic a little bit. Whoops. Okay. Next, we'll move this guy down here and same deal Let's check the center tap 5.42 5.42 okay now let's move him down the line Seven point two four. Seven point two four. Any guesses on why that's in the range of seven point two and the other ones are in the range of five point four? I'll give you a second and then I'll tell you why. This one's gonna be in the hood of seven point four as well. All right. 7.25, okay, 7.25. So the reason for that is because if you can imagine the, the transformer, the output transformer has got a, a core to it, and, and on one side of the center tap, you have the windings going around that core, and, uh, and that's for one side of the center tap, and that's 
probably for this side here, right? And then uh, for the other side of the center tap, the windings go around the first set of windings, right? Around the first wire that's going around there. And so um, what you end up with is a uh, longer wire um, to, to uh, go to cover this side of the center tap as opposed to this side. More wire, more resistance. Yep. Okay. So you're going to see a bigger voltage drop um, when you have more, more resistance like that. Okay. So um, uh, those are th uh, the core measurements we need to take with the amplifier on. Now we can turn the amplifier off. Okay. And the output transformer is still warm. And we want to get the plate to center tap measurement for each of the tubes. I should have left that on there. Uh, we want to get the plate to center tap resistance. So I'm going to put that back on there. And we're going to change the multimeter to resistance. And now we're going to uh, probe the, uh, the, the same. It's the exact same measurement as we were just taking, only we're looking now at the resistance. Amp is off. 107.8. Like I said, I think we'll see a higher resistance um, on this side of the center tap than on the other side. Put that down, 107.8. And this should be almost identical for both tubes on the one side of the center tap. Let's try this again here. 107.8. There it is. Write that down. All right, let's move on down the line here. Now we're going to see the resistance drop. Shorter wire going around the core of the do transformer. 74.7. And if I'm not mistaken, we'll get almost the exact same reading on uh, the fourth tube, 74.7, .7. beautiful. Uh, so now we have pretty much all the measurements we need to take uh, in order to uh, calculate the plate dissipation uh, for each one of these tubes right here. So uh, again, um, that was a good bit of hands-on there, or I should say hand-on. Remember, when an amp is on, even when it's off, you don't really want to be poking around in there with two hands. In fact, if you can get away with poking around with no hands, that's better. Now, some guys, what they'll do is they'll find a way to clip both probes onto something, and then they'll just turn the amp on, and they'll take a reading off the multimeter. Then they'll turn the amp off, unclip, Reclip for the next reading, turn it on, and they'll maybe even discharge the electrolytic capacitors in between. Uh, the issue with that is, is that um, we spent an hour warming the amp up. We want to keep it at that right where it was, you know, operating in, at that, um, uh, basically at that stable setting that it, it, it kind of gets to once it's been on for probably 30 minutes, or maybe even less. But we had it on for an hour. So... Uh, now we've got all the measurements, we need to go plug them into my spreadsheet and we will be able to calculate the plate dissipation for each tube and then we'll compare that uh, against um, the, uh, the data sheet for the EL84 to see if we're over or we're under. Um, we might even get some surprises. We might be, we'll be able to see to some extent if, if there's no problems, that is, we'll be able to see what the designers of this amp we're thinking about when they uh, were setting voltages and, and, and designing the circuit in a way that uh, would produce a, a cool, unique amplifier that they could put on the market. All right, so let's go to the spreadsheet next. Okay, now that we've collected all the various values that we need for calculating the plate dissipation, we're here at my plate dissipation spreadsheet. and Right now, this only has the output transformer method on the bottom here, this one tab. 
Uh, I'll have other tabs here for other methods, uh, but we're only going to be doing the, the output transformer method for this uh, particular AMP today. Uh, I will put a link to this spreadsheet in the show notes so that you can go and look at it and copy it. Just be aware of the various disclaimers I have. I have the uh, big disclaimer at the top about how dangerous amplifiers are, and I also have uh, some more information about that down here. It says read this first. It's actually very important that you read those and uh, that you're clear that this spreadsheet is only so you can see how I do the calculations. It's not a recommendation that you do them. I just want people to be able to learn from doing these calculations. Anytime you stick your hands in an amplifier, there's high voltage there. It could kill you. So you have to be very, very careful. All right. So we're going to plug the numbers that we just collected off the amp into this spreadsheet. And it's going to automatically calculate the plate dissipation for each of the tubes based on the output transformer method, which I believe to be the uh, most accurate method based on everything that I've read out there. Now, the way I've set this up is the first thing I do is I put in uh, which type of tube it is. This is just so I can print this spreadsheet out when I'm done. It's the EL84, which is also called the 6BQ5. And then you have to go to uh, a tube data sheet to figure out what the other values they have to fill in here are. For example, what the maximum number of watts for plate dissipation are. And if you look it up on some of the various uh, tube data sheets from the different manufacturers, you will see that it's 12 watts. So I'm going to put that in here. Now in terms of the amperage uh, maximum value for tubes, uh, this could vary uh, depending on which classification of amplifier you're looking at. And this is where tube data sheets also vary because some tube data sheets only show you uh, the ratings and the maximum values for class A operation. Others show you for class AB. Uh, so you have to make sure that when you're looking at these data sheets that you find what you're looking for. In my case, I found that the uh, Millard data sheet for the EL84 was the most complete. And the maximum amperage for an EL84 in a push-pull configuration is 42. So I'm going to put that in here. Okay, so now let's head on down to the section where we fill our data in. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the values for the plate to center tap uh, resistance. And if you recall, we did that. That was one of the first ones we did. And so we have 107.8 for the uh, first tube, 107.8 for the second tube. Uh, now, uh, further below, by the way, here, I do provide some data on how I took these measurements in case you didn't follow the video. Uh, you can read this and you can see how I take these measurements and this is just a reminder that when you're doing the uh, output transformer method and you're measuring the resistance uh, on either side of the center tap of the output transformer you're going to see some very different numbers and that's going to show up here 74.7 74.7 I originally thought they should be equal, but as it turns out, if you think about how a transformer is built, you have one, one wire that's associated with one side of the center tap that wraps around the core of the transformer. It's going to be a lot shorter than the wire, the other wire. So what they do is they wrap that wire around the core for one side, and then they wrap the wire for the other side around that first one. And that's why you have wires of two very different lengths and why you have different uh, resistances in terms of your... Uh, plate to center tap uh, measurements. Now the voltage drop um, from the plate to the center tap, that's what we measured uh, I think next, I don't remember, but we're going to go ahead and put those values in. So 7.25 for the first tube and 7.24 for the second. 5.42 for the third tube, 5.39 for the second tube. And you'll notice that even though there is very different resistance on either side of the center tap, once you start plugging these values in, they all start coming in pretty close to one another, right? And, uh, and so then the next thing we show here is it just calculated the plate current for you. So we have 
somewhere in the range of 33 to 36. And uh, then the spreadsheet will automatically tell you are tell you where you are uh, in terms of how that compares to the uh, valve specification. So it's basically looking at this number 42 and giving you some idea of where you are for that. When you look out on the web, you're going to find a lot of different opinions about where tubes should be operated. Generally speaking, they say that they should run them around 70%. So you can see how in this case, the, the tubes are running uh, pretty hot, right? Uh, they're pretty well above the 70% you know, when you look at the um, plate current. Uh, however, um, you're going to see that the math starts to work out when we look at the final wattage. So uh, this is high. If I wanted to bring the plate current down more to the 70-75% range, then I would have to increase the value of that one shared uh, cathode bias resistor. Okay. Now the plate voltage, so we're looking at the voltage that's right on the plate, and we took that measurement. I'm going to put these in right now. So 285.3, whoops, a little typo there, 284, 287.3. There you go. So now we're showing the final calculations. And uh, this is showing the, the plate dissipation in terms of watts. In fact, maybe I should just put right here that these are watts. Just do that right now. Let's center it so it looks nice and pretty. So there you go. Uh, you can see the plate dissipation across all the tubes. Uh, the uh, tube is rated for 12 watts, as you can see up here. Um, these are below the value of 12 watts, but still above kind of that recommended value of around 70% when you're running tubes. So again, the tubes are running a little hot. I don't think I'm going to be bringing the value down. I'm not going to make any modifications to this amp. It shows you how different amplifier designers like to push their tubes or push their designs, and uh, again, we're not exceeding any maximum values, but uh, it should be known that the hotter you're going to run your tubes, the harder it's going to be on those tubes, and the more uh, you'll be replacing those tubes because they'll wear out sooner. So this is uh, the final math for the tubes in this amp. It checks out pretty good. We're not going to make any changes, but we still have a little bit more work to do uh, because I noticed that with this amplifier, uh, the fasteners for putting the chassis into the, uh, the, the cabinet uh, were a little messed up. So uh, I'm going to show you what I had to do there next. All right, so here we are back at the chassis. And if you recall, one of the things that I mentioned earlier in the video was that when I first got this amp, all I got was the chassis and I didn't get the cabinet. Well, now it's close to that time where you have to put the chassis back into the cabinet, and this is when we discovered some interesting facts and issues when it comes to uh, these fasteners that are used for uh, attaching the chassis to the cabinet. If you look really closely here, there's a little, it's kind of loose, but it's a, it's a nut that's in uh, a little bit of a cage. In fact, they're called cage nuts. Here's what one looks like uh, by itself. And uh, when I first decided that I was gonna uh, kinda get the chassis back into the cabinet, I asked the owner for the screws because he gave me the chassis, he gave me the cabinet, but he didn't give me the screws. And uh, this is not the screw he gave me. He couldn't find the screws. So I thought, all right, I'll go out and find screws that match the threading in the nuts that are here, in these cage nuts, and uh, I'll get some brass ones because it'll look good with the tweed. Well, as it turns out, I could not find any screw that matched the threading of these cage nuts. Nothing worked. 
like this one doesn't really work. It, it gets in there, but then it, it stops pretty quickly like that. It doesn't really screw in all the way. So I went over this with the owner. I'm like, I really need those screws, and we couldn't find them. And then we hypothesized that the reason that it gets so tight and no screw really matches that is that this is actually, if you look on the side of these cage nuts, it says 832. In fact, I don't even know if you can see here. Uh, you might be able to see it, but here's another cage nut right there, and there's another one down here. And you might be able to see it says, you can see some writing on the side there. It says 832. And uh, these are, that, that described, by the way, the width of the hole and the density of the threading. These screws are 832 screws. So you have to wonder, well, why doesn't, why don't they fit? Well, the, the theory goes that the threads were damaged just a little bit so that it would be very tight. That way it wouldn't come loose. And if you think about how this amp has been built with all this kind of silicone rubber that was originally around the capacitors, it was built so nothing came loose. So that kind of makes sense because if I go through the cabinet into this cage nut here and I start to screw it down, it gets very tight. I, I, would, I can probably crank on it and it will more than likely damage the threads here, but then it'll never come out. Now what I thought I would do is I would replace the cage nuts here and, uh, and just put some ones where they fit. For example, that's why I bought some of these. And you can see that this one fits pretty nicely. See? And by the way, I don't know if you can see, and it kind of tilt it, but the writing on the side, uh, oh, this one doesn't say 832 on it, but that's what it is. It's an 832. So I'm going to take that off. Okay. And uh, one of the issues that we discovered when I thought I was going to try to replace these was, guess what? Uh, it's really hard to find ones that are the right size of the, the total assembly. These are the whole assembly, the nut and the cage are much smaller here on these guys here uh, than this one. And I ordered a, a little, like about 12 of these for a few bucks from Amazon. I went to a lot of different hardware stores, but I didn't realize that these things would actually be different sizes. So uh, that's not going to work. My, my plan was to use something like this one and then to make sure it didn't come loose I would use like a little bit of Loctite on the threads. So that's a fail. Uh, what's, what, what are we going to do? Well, we're just going to go with what they originally did which is, you know, they had these, they kind of don't fit and I'll just crank it in there so it's nice and tight. That's just the way we're going to do it. However, as you can see, by the way, uh, just real quick, for some reason these ones work fine. These like go through the top of the cabinet because this chassis actually sits vertically and uh, you can see that um, the screws that I bought here work just fine. Why that is, I don't know. All right, the next problem was that I noticed, and it's not critical because we have, uh, not only do we have these, uh, these two here which fasten the chassis from the top, but we also have these guys going around here and these fasten the chassis to the uh, back of the cabinet. But one problem is this guy is missing. Not critical because we have one, two, three, four, five. We have enough of the other ones that will hold it in place. But I thought it would be nice to get that one fixed up. Unfortunately, as I pointed out, this assembly is too big. If I try to get it in there, it doesn't even come close. It's, it's, you can sit it on top, you can see how much bigger the whole assembly is, even though the nut is the right size. So, I have two choices. I can either try to make this fit into this hole, which would mean filing the hole out, or what I did was I went and I picked up one of these, what they call a U-nut. It's like a clip. And this one is also 832, and you can see that if I just kind of Put it on like that. That'll work. So I bought one of these, 55 cents, 
By the way, as you can tell, not all amplifier repair is very glamorous. Sometimes you have to mess around with things like cage nuts and U-nuts to make it all work and get it back to the owner in tip-top shape. Problem is, is that if you slide this on, if you clip it on to the, the metal here, and you go all the way down, let's just say, I'm not going to do it right now, but you can see, like, if I line it up, it doesn't quite line up with the hole. So that when the screw goes through the cabinet, it's going to come through the cabinet, and it's probably going to hit right about there, which is no good. So we have to figure out a way to get the clip nut closer to the center of the hole so it sits over like that. And I think that my plan here is I'm going to take a file, and I'm literally going to file the metal down, so that I can get this clip nut on like that and then it will be in the right position so that when I when the screw comes through the cabinet it'll go right there so that is my plan uh, and hopefully it'll work out and when I come back you'll see that I'll I have filed this down and I'll put the clip nut on and then we'll get this chassis into the cabinet and finally back to the owner Alrighty, so uh, I dug up a file, an old rusty metal file here, I haven't used it in ages, and uh, I filed away at this little location right here, right, and as you can see, I've uh, made a nice notch right there. And uh, this is a little bit of back and forth, the notch is actually bigger than the file, so I kind of went up and down a lot, and then I also went to the sides to kind of uh, widen the notch and then basically I kept comparing it to the size of my U-nut which is uh, right there. So let's give it a try now because uh, I think I've, I'm down to the last part here. So I'm going to stick that in and look at that. Isn't that perfect? Whoops, just dropped the file. But that's okay. So now I've got the um, the hole is nice and centered there. I mean, that wouldn't be bad to actually do over here too, right? But uh, now it will fit perfectly so that when I go to uh, put the, um, the amp, uh, the chassis back into the cabinet, uh, the screw that's going to go through the back of the cabinet into this particular location is uh, it's going to go right in and uh, match perfectly. So now that's great because um, we have all f all six one two three four five six uh, locations perfectly set up in order to uh, uh, take the screws and attach this uh, chassis to the cabinet. Which again, I was missing the screws. Uh, the uh, owner couldn't find them, so. Uh, hopefully, once we get it all hooked up, we'll be in good shape. We'll next steps will be to put this back in the cabinet. So uh, I'll spare you the gory details of screwing it all in and all that. And the next thing we'll see is the chassis literally in the cabinet, uh, almost ready to go. One thing that's interesting is I go to put this chassis back in the cabinet from a design perspective is how difficult it is to service this amp if you have to replace the tubes. Uh, as you can see, you know, whereas a lot of amps the tubes sort of hang down, in this amp the tubes are literally uh, poking forward, you know, towards the front of the amp, right? Because uh, you, know, you can see the tube sockets right there. The tubes are literally, um, you know, pointing outwards instead of pointing down. And so you can imagine, like, in order to uh, service those tubes without pulling the entire amp apart, you have to uh, kind of, um, you know, reach all the way under here and start fiddling with them, which, uh, boy, that's, that's tough, right? Now, the, uh, the back of the amp is right here, so I'm just going to hold that up. And there isn't an opening in the bottom, but... That is not an easy design to work with at all. So, uh, yeah, you know, you gotta go all the way down here and gotta go in there and up that way. You gotta reach up, it's, it's not easy to get to that, those tubes there. You can't even see what you're doing. So, uh, kind of surprised at that design, but uh, 
hey, um, maybe the idea is, is that instead of putting the the chassis in the cabinet this way, you attach it to the back first. And then maybe in order to replace the tubes, you just pull the whole back off and the chassis comes with it. And then that's how you service it. But that's pretty different in, in terms of design compared to other amplifiers. Okay, well, here's the moment of truth. We've got the crate amp fully back together. The back's on, the chassis's in the cabinet. And uh, we've got her powered up, and it's been warming up for a little bit. Got my Tellier all hooked up, ready to go. Not the greatest guitar player, but don't really have to be to test whether or not the amp is ready or not. So, um, here we go. I'm on the clean channel right now. Sounded pretty good for an amp that was completely dead when it got here, huh? Alrighty, that was the clean channel. I've uh, flipped the switch to the dirty channel, and let's see how that sounds. Alright, uh, sounds pretty good. Not bad. Dirty channel sounds pretty good too. I'm not the greatest guitar player, but then again, you don't have to be to know that it's working pretty well. So there you have it, uh, my rookie repair here in the amp lab. So thanks very much for watching. If you liked what you saw, then click like, maybe a share, anything you do, subscribe. Uh, just try to increase the visibility of my videos that way other people can learn from them too I don't make any money on them so it's really uh, just for fun and just to share what I'm learning with you that way uh, you can learn and improve your amp and radio repair skills so from my amp lab in Boston Massachusetts I'm Dave the amp mechanic thanks for watching mm -hmm.